Good morning. We want to welcome you to Pleasant Acres Free Will Baptist Church. My name is Scott Connickill, and I have the privilege of serving as the senior pastor of this great, great ministry. For more than a half a century, God has allowed Pleasant Acres Free Will Baptist Church to shine the light of Christ to this world, to share the love of Christ with the people in our community, and to shape the people of Christ so that they can do great and mighty things for them. If you're visiting with us today and you're a first-time guest, we want to welcome you to our service and we want to invite you to come and be a part. Again, we want to say thank you for joining us for our service today. It is our prayer that God will minister to our hearts as we worship Him together. I understand that there are going to be times in my life when God does something that I don't understand. You best rest assured, God understands. God understands. There's never a time in your life, in my life, or God's life, which by the way, has been forever, that God did not know exactly what he was doing. So the question is, what do we do when God does something that we do not understand? This is a Free Will Baptist Hour, a time of worship and teaching of God's unchanging truth applied in our world today. This week, Pleasant Acres Free Will Baptist Church on Old Cherry Point Road in Newburn invites us into their Sunday morning worship service. Well, right now, let's rejoin Pastor Scott Coghill and the congregation at Pleasant Acres Free Will Baptist Church for the pre-recorded broadcast of the Free Will Baptist Hour. It makes 
makes me want to shout hallelujah thank you jesus lord you're worthy of all the glory and all the honor and all the praise it makes me want to shout God's people said, listen, if that doesn't make you want to shout, then something's wrong with your shouter, amen? We'll shout for a ball game, and we'll shout for our kids, and we'll even shout at our kids, amen? But I'm telling you, when you think about the Lord and what God has done for us and saving our soul from hell and giving us a relationship with God through grace and through faith, listen, that ought to make even a frugal Baptist shout. And we thank God for his salvation. What a great salvation God has given us. And I'm glad you're here today. Let's bow for a word of prayer. And let's ask God's blessing on this service. And would you pray right now that God would do a special work in your heart this morning? The kind of work that only God can do.
Well, when God saved you, he didn't save you to go back. He saved you to move forward. Amen. favorite songs. So glad today that not only has God saved us, but once God saved us, he's promised to defend us. Let's sing about it this morning. He is near to the broken. He is close to the weary of heart. In his name. defender and your savior. Amen. I want you to lift up your voice. Sing this second verse with us. I will sing of my redeemer. Testify to the touch of his hand. Lift and
Has there ever been anything in your life that's happened where you kind of came away from it saying, you know, I really didn't understand that? There were concepts in school that the teacher would teach, and I had some good teachers. I had some that were not so good, but I had some pretty good teachers in school, and, and yet there were things that, that they would teach, especially one, Miss Mills. Uh, there were things in chemistry. You know, I, I'm a big math guy, not real big on science. And she would teach some things in chemistry, and she'd do a great job. She was a great teacher, at least some people said that. And, and uh, she would teach, and by the time she was done, all the smart kids got it. And I'm sitting there thinking, I have no idea what you just said. I don't understand. I think there are things that happen in our life that we look at, and we know there's a God. And yet we just come away saying, Lord, at least at this point in my life, I really don't understand. I don't understand why that's happening. I don't understand why that happened. I, I don't understand what you're doing. I just don't understand. I was um, I was at Gent Sandwich Shop uh, this morning. How many know where Gent Sandwich Shop is? Anyway, I um, I was there and I was I was getting ready to walk in and study and I was on the phone with Brother David Price this morning. Me and Brother David have a lot in common, and one of the things we have in common is both of us like to talk. Today, I just I called him a, running a couple of things by him and just talking, and, and uh, I thought it was going to be a few minutes, and I, I don't know, I think we talked 40 minutes this morning probably, and uh, while I was talking to him, I didn't want to go into the restaurants a little bit loud, and once I get in there, I try to get geared into what I'm doing and studying and preparing, and, and so I was kind of pacing the sidewalk out in front of the restaurant while we were talking, and, and there was a guy who rode up on a bike uh, while we were talking. And I, and I, you know, I noticed him. He, he rode up on the bike. He leaned his bike against the post. He sat on the bench that's right out front of the restaurant. And, and he just kind of sat there. And so I, I, you know, kept my eye on him. I try to be aware of my surroundings the best I can while I'm talking. And, and then probably five or six minutes after he was sitting there, he got up. And I was kind of pacing back toward the front door. And he started pacing toward me. And uh, so anyway, he, he approaches me and and, and I told David, I said, David, hang on a second. And he, he said, sir, I overheard you talking about work and, and a job. And, and, and honestly, when I responded to him, I said, buddy, I'm a pastor. We don't have any work, you know. And I didn't even realize what I said. But, but I was, and then I said, if you'll hang on, I'll be off the phone in a minute and I'll talk to you. So he went back and sat down. I finished up with David, went over and started talking to him. And, uh, of course, he he, he went in, in length and telling me kind of his story, and, and he made the statement to me. And, and the whole time, by the way, you know me, I, I'm always like from point A to point B, and I'm supposed to have been there 15 minutes ago, but I wasn't, and so I'm always in a hurry. And, and I was in a hurry to get in there and study because I've got to feed your soul, plus I was dying for some coffee. And so I was, I was kind of, he was kind of in my way in getting into the restaurant, but... The longer I stood there, it was like the Holy Spirit said, slow down. Even Jesus needed to go through Samaria. And this is possibly a divine appointment. Who knows? So the whole time the Holy Spirit's talking to me on the inside, he's talking to me on the outside. And I start listening to a story. And God began to speak to my own heart. And I, I really empathize with the guy. And... I'm saddened at some of the things he went through. We probably talked a half hour um, outside the restaurant this morning. I didn't have a job to offer him. I had some, what money I had and some advice. But one of the things he said was, he, he gave me this long list of things that's happened in his life over the last month. And he said, and by the end of the conversation, he was calling me preacher. He said, preacher, he said, I just don't understand what God's trying to do. And, and that, if nothing else, it rang a bell in my heart because since Monday, I, I, I thought I knew what direction I wanted to go. So I've been reading the story of Gideon in Judges 7. Because Gideon is a prime example of someone who was in a situation and yet God began to do something 
And I'm sure that Gideon did not understand what God was trying to do. You know the story. You've heard it since you were a kid. I know the story well, and yet it is... It has again today been very refreshing to me to see what God did in Gideon's life. Judges 7 is where we are. We're going to read 22 verses, and I want to go through the story together. The Bible says, Then Zerubbabel, who was Gideon, and all the people that were with him rose up early and, and pitched beside the well of Harod, so that the host of the Midianites were on the north side of them by the, the hill of Moray in the valley. And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, My own hand hath saved me. Now let's logically look at this up to this point. God has called Gideon the leader of this army. The army at this point was 32,000 men. 32,000 men. Well, you would say, well, that's a great army. Not when you're going against the Midianites, who were probably anywhere from 100 to 200,000 men and soldiers. So already in chapter 7, verse 2, God's army is already outmanned. And yet God has the audacity to come to Gideon and to say, Gideon, you have too many. I wonder at this point if there was anything in Gideon's life that wanted to say, God, why don't you go around and count the Midianites? <laughs> why don't you go over there and say, hey guys, you got too many. No, we're already outnumbered. We're either outnumbered three to one or six to one. One or the other or somewhere in the middle, but we are outnumbered. We are outmanned. We are outgunned. They've got bigger weapons. They've got more training than we do. Lord, I think you've got it wrong. And yet God said, Gideon, your army is too many. And I'm sure from verse two, Gideon is already in the mode that many of us get in. God, I don't understand. I don't understand. Verse three. God said, now therefore go to proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. And there returned the people twenty and two thousand, and there remained ten thousand. Now I have to believe, if Gideon's anything like me, and Gideon was a coward, but if he's anything like me besides that, I would have to believe, well, God, if I go to my army and tell them, whoever's afraid, and I'm sure Gideon said it like this, Whichever one of you guys are sissies, whichever one of you don't want to man up, whichever one of you little fraidy cat and have to sleep with a blankie at night, because that's how I would have said it, I would have guilted them into staying. Whichever one of you got a tattoo of your mama's name on your back or something, you know, you bunch of wimps, whoever it is, you can go home. And I'm sure, Brother B, I'm sure Gideon's like, ain't nobody leaving. Out of 32,000, 22,000 left left now it's not three to one or six to one now it's ten to one or twenty to one and I'm sure at this point if in verse two he didn't say God I don't understand I'm sure at this point he said Lord I really don't understand we're getting ready to go and we the army of Israel bear your name and we're getting ready to go to battle and lose I don't understand. And so this happened. 22,000 sissies left. The Bible says there remained 10,000. And the Lord said to Gideon in verse 4, the people are yet too many. Now, and in verse 2, if he's not like, Lord, I don't understand, but I'll go through with it. And then he goes through with it. And in verse 3, he's like, Lord, I really don't understand. I'm sure by verse 4, he's like, God, I really, really don't understand. Because we're already outnumbered. 3 to 1, maybe 6 to 1. All right? They've already got better training, better weapons. All right? They're the Midianites. They're known for war. We're not. We've got 32,000. They've got 100 to 200,000. Now they're too many. 22,000. God, you heard me. 22,000 left. We've got 10 
8,000 guys who are now probably as afraid as those who left. And you're saying, there's still too many? I really, really don't understand. He said, yet there are too many. Bring them down into the water. And I will try them for thee there. God said, I'm going to test them there. And it shall be that of whom I say unto thee, this shall go with thee, the same shall go with thee. And whomsoever I say unto thee, this shall not go with thee, the same shall not go with thee. Now what's interesting about that to me in verse number four, and by the way, we have to read 22 verses and we're in verse four. What's interesting about that to me is that God did not tell Gideon his plan yet for this test. Because human nature would have been, if God did, all along the way to the water, I'd been saying, don't do this. Don't do this. Pass the word. Don't do this. Pass the word. Don't do this. Pass the word. Because they didn't know what it was. They didn't know they were being tested. God was going to test them, and he did not want Gideon to know. He was getting ready to stretch Gideon's faith like Gideon's faith had never been stretched before. And so they go to the water. And notice how the Bible describes what they did at the water. So he brought them down, the people, into the water. And the Lord said to Gideon, everyone that lappeth the water with their tongue as a dog lappeth, him shall thou set by himself. And likewise, everyone that boweth down upon his knees to drink. Now, there's been some confusion through the years on, on what each one of these mean. I, I guess if you were to go to the Hebrew word for lap and to understand probably what he was saying, the first group of people, they bent down probably to one knee. Most believe as they bent down to one knee, which was customary in a soldier's day, they would keep one hand upon their weapon they would cup the water up to their mouth and then they would drink it like that. The other one says that they, they knelt down, which was with both knees, and they literally put their face in the water, all right? And so of the ones that knelt down with one knee, there were 300. Of the ones that knelt down with both knees and put their face in the water, probably tired, were 9,700. Now, guess which one, and by the way, God still hadn't revealed to Gideon. He said, you said this, this kind over here, and you said this kind over here. When he looked at the numbers, he saw 300 and 9,700. Guess which one Gideon was voting for? <laughs> the 9,700. Guess which one he got? The 300. The Bible says, and the Lord said in verse 7 unto Gideon, by the 300 men that lapped, Will I save you? And at this point, Gideon's got to be, Lord, I'm at a loss. I trust you, but I'm at a loss. But even people that trust God don't always understand God. I believe Gideon trusted God. <laughs> and I'm sure there with his 300 closest buddies now, he's like, okay, God, whatever you say. <laughs> but nice knowing you guys. Um, 300 guys against 100 to 200,000 of the Midianites. Let's keep reading the story. So the people took victuals in their hand and the trumpets and they sent uh, all the rest of the Israel, every man into his tent, and retained those 300 men, the host of the Midian beneath him in the valley. If you can picture the Midianites were camped in, in, beneath this, this valley. And so already the Israelites had the high ground. But instead of it being 32,000, instead of it being 10,000, instead of it being 9,700, there were 300 men that now possessed the high ground, which still probably were not very good odds or strategy. And it came to pass that the, that the same night, that same night, the Lord said unto him, Arise and get thee down unto the host, for I had delivered it into thy hand. But if thou fear to go down, go thou with uh, Farah, thy servant, down to the host. And thou shalt hear what they say, and afterward shall thine hands be strengthened to go down to the host. And when he went down with the servant of the armed men that were at the host, and the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the children of the east lay along 
in the valley like grasshopper for multitude. Their camels were without number as the sand by the seaside for multitude. <laughs> Can you imagine? God said, hey, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go spy on them. You got the high ground. At least you got 300 guys. I want you to go down there. And if you don't want to go down there, you go down there with your servant. And you go spy on them. And when he went down there, it was worse than he thought because it just wasn't the Midianites. It was the Midianites and the Amalekites. And he said, all the armies of the east and their camels and their little puppy dogs. And it was like, they were like the sands of the sea. Can you imagine how fearful? You know how it is. You get scared at night. You're home alone. I know some of you know I don't get scared at night. Yeah, you'd been the 22,000 that left early. No, the, the house creaks, you know. Even when, I, when I'm home by myself, just things just make noise, you know. And, and, and say what you want. There, there's something in you, something in every person that says, I don't like that making noise right now. Why can't you make noise during the day? It makes noise at night, and you just kind of get your little scared. At night, can you imagine how scared Gideon was? He said, and if you're afraid, take your servant. Oh, that makes me feel a lot better. They're like the sands of the sea. Verse 13. And when Gideon was come, behold, there was a man that told a dream unto his fellow and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream. And lo, a cake of barley tumbled to the host of Midian and came into a tent and smote it that fell and overturned it that the tent lay long. And his fellow answered and said, This is nothing else save the the sword of Gideon and the son of Joash, a man of Israel. For into his hand God hath delivered Midian and all the host. And it was so when Gideon heard the telling of the dream and the interpretation thereof, that he worshipped and he returned to the host of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord hath delivered into your hand the host of Midian. What a change. Now, let me ask you a question. Did Gideon, even at this point, yet understand? Probably not. But with confidence, Gideon went forward and told those 300 men, arise. And he divided 300 men into three companies. And, and he put a trumpet in every man's hand, an empty pitcher, and the, and the lamps within the pitchers. And if you'll picture this, he said, okay, here, here's the plan, guys. You ready? He's like, oh yeah, I'm ready. And you can imagine the, the, the 9,700 that left, they left all of their supplies, probably even left their weapons. So here's 300 guys and they got weapons for 9,700 people. And they're like, oh my goodness, every guy gets three, three swords, maybe five, maybe 10. And he's like, we're leaving the swords here. Okay. Take a trumpet, a torch, and a pitcher. And a gun? <laughs> no. A trumpet, the ram's horn, a torch, and a pitcher. What's the pitcher for? It's to hide the light until we get around them and I say, go. That's it? Yeah. What are we going to do? The story says, we're going to surround them. Great. What are we going to do then? We're going to take the pitchers off the torches by breaking them. Great. What are we going to do then? Set them on fire? No. We're going to play a song with our trumpets, really, <laughs> and wake them up and let them know we're here. Gideon, that's a great idea. Somebody put him out of his misery. Can you imagine the 300 listening? They had already been here. This is the same night. They just saw 9,700 of their brethren leave. The day previous, they saw 22,000 leave. It's just us. They're like, lucky us. And we're going to play the Midianites a song before they kill us what the story said. Verse 17, he said unto them, look on me and do likewise. And behold, when I come to the outside of the camp, it shall be that as I do, so shall ye do. And I know what they're thinking. They're hoping, I hope Gideon's running <laughs> because that's what I'm going to do. When I blow with the, with the trumpet, I and all that are with me, then blow with the trumpet also on every side of the camp and say, The sword of the Lord 
and of Gideon. So Gideon and the hundred men that were with him in one of those three companies came into the outside of the camp in the beginning of the middle watch. Now, by the way, that is so crucial. Sometimes we read right past that. What was the middle watch? If there's a debate on exactly what time it was, but this is what we do know. We do know that there was a shift change. And if you know anything about war, you know a shift change is a good time to get in because there's some confusion. The people that are supposed to be standing guard, they're changing with somebody. So if something happens, they don't know who's in charge. It's the perfect time. By the way, who do you think knew that? God. Even when we don't understand, we can sometimes still see God's logic in things. And so God, right in the middle, watch, right at the shift change. The Bible says, in verse 19, Gideon and his hundred men, they had newly set the watch. And they blew the trumpets and break the pitchers that were in their hands. And the three companies blew their trumpets and they break the pitchers and held the lamps in their left hands, the, the trumpet in the right hand to blow with all, and they cried out together. And you can imagine in that valley how it echoed the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And you're like, what happened? And they stood every man in his place around about the camp, and all the host ran and cried and fled. Not the host of Israel, but the host of the Midianites and the Amalekites and the armies of the east. And I can imagine their camels and everything else they had with them. I can imagine when they opened their eyes to that echoing sound and they looked up and they were surrounded inside of this valley, they felt like probably they were sitting ducks. They looked up and I don't believe they saw three hundred men. There's no telling what they saw. They might have seen three million angels for all we know. But they lifted up and looked, and they looked around, and they were not even in their right mind. And they started running, and they started fleeing. They started crying out. And notice, the Bible says, And the 300 blew the trumpets, and the Lord set every man's sword against his fellow. Even throughout the entire host, what did they do? They were so frightened that they drew their own swords and they were killing their own people as Gideon and the army of 300 were playing a song and lifting up a torch and letting God fight the battle. I, this is what I understand. I understand that there are going to be times in my life when God does something that I don't understand. But this is what I want you to go home with tonight. You best rest assured, God understands. God understands. There's never a time in your life, in my life, or God's life, which by the way, has been forever, that God did not know exactly what he was doing. So the question tonight is, what do we do when God does something that we do not understand. Let me give you three things tonight. Number one, what do you do when God does or allows something that you do not understand? Here's the first thing you always do. Always, always, always. What does always mean? Always means always, and that's always what always means. Amen? Number one, you always obey. Always. L Lord, I, I do not, I don't see how this benefits me. That's okay. You don't have to see how it benefits you. You're just supposed to obey. Uh, Lord, uh, Lord, I'm not sure how this kind of fits into my plans and my vision. And God, truth is, I, I've read your word. I'm not sure how it fits in yours. That's okay. It's not for you to understand. It is simply for you to obey. I mean, there are things in the scriptures, ladies and gentlemen, that sometimes I have a hard time reconciling. And yet it is not my job to figure everything out. It is my job to simply obey. I got that principle from my dad years ago. 
My daddy was a stickler on obedience. A stickler. If my dad said something, guess what? He expected it to be obeyed. How many had a dad like that? How many understand that when we didn't obey, things happened? And they were never good. Never. My dad was soft-spoken by word, but I'm going to tell you what, he could numb my rear end quick. I know. I lived my entire life getting my rear end numbed. I mean, that's just how my dad was. You didn't obey, but, but that, it didn't matter. You were getting a whipping. Not a spanking, not discipline, a whipping. Why? Because my dad expected what he said. He expected to be obeyed. There were times where just in lapses of intelligence, there were, there were several times in my childhood where I had those, where my dad would say something and I would say something as crazy as, why? That just didn't rub my dad the wrong way. It really rubbed him the wrong way. Why? And then he would be so mad, that he didn't want to kill me. And so he'd be so mad, he'd send me to my room, but he would say something like, it doesn't matter why, you do it because I said so. Now, by the way, I've had talks with my dad since then. I do not believe as a parent, that's a good answer. I wasn't dare going to say that to him then, you know. That's not a good answer. Wham! <laughs> yeah. But, because I, I do believe that your kids need to understand why. But the truth is, when God tells you to do something, all he has to do is say, because I said so. Whether you understand it or not. There were things as a kid growing up, I would ask my dad to let me do. And there were reasons why my dad did not. And I did not understand them. By the way, can I just put the clutch in and call a timeout for a second? Parents, you, you, you need to get some courage and be willing to tell your kids no. In fact, let's practice that together. No. Can we practice that, everybody? You curl your, your lips around and just say, no. It's, it's literally, it's really life-giving. And then you get used to it, and it doesn't even matter what they ask. You just say, no, and it feels great. No. But you, you know what the problem is? The problem with this generation coming up, one of the problems is they have parents who refuse to tell them no. Sometimes my dad told me no, and he had good reasons. And as a kid, I didn't understand them, but as a parent, I do now. Sometimes God tells us no, and we don't understand. But it doesn't matter if we understand. God doesn't expect us to understand everything. What God expects is for us to obey. To obey. Again, verse 2. Lord, what do you mean there are too many? I'm like, God, are, are you, are you crazy? I don't want to say that to God. Are you, I'm not sure what I'm supposed to say. Lord, I don't think this makes any sense. That's okay. But your arm is too many. Okay, God. I'll go out there and tell any of them, if you're sissies, go home. 22,000 left. Oh, Lord. I don't understand. Well, there's still too many. Lord, what do you mean it's too many? I got 10,000. I mean, they've got like, they're like the sands of the sea. Their camels have swords. What do you mean it's too many? It's too many. God, I don't understand. You don't have to understand. Just obey. That's what Gideon did. Number one, when God does something you don't understand, the first thing you need to do is obey. The second thing you need to do is trust. Is trust. I, I think sometimes God puts us in situations and allows things in our life simply because he wants to first of all test our obedience. But I also want to, I think God sometimes wants to test our level of leaning on him. For instance, John chapter 6, one of my favorite stories. When Jesus lifted up his eyes and saw the great company that was coming to him, he said unto Philip, and this is Jesus. And by the way, you know this, I've been preaching to you long enough. When Jesus asks a question, he already knows the answer. Now you think when you ask a question, you already know the answer. Most of the time you don't. But when Jesus asked the question, he already knew the answer. And he asked the disciples, when shall we buy bread to feed all these people? 
Jesus asked that. How many believe Jesus already knew what he was going to do? Every one of us. And if you don't, you need to understand he's God. He knows everything. Well, Philip said, well, 200 penny worth is not enough to feed all these folks. Now, either that was a year's wages or that's all they could collect as far as an offering there to try to go to the, the city and buy something. He's like, well, we have 200 penny worth, and, but that's not enough for anything. And then Andrew says, well, Lord, there's a lad here. He said, Andrew said, I got one less than that, Philip. He said, I got, I got a lad. And he's got a little bag lunch. He's got five little silver dollar pancakes. He's got two sardines. And then he says this. He says, what is this among so many? And that's when Jesus in John chapter 6 said, have the men sit down. Jesus said, I'm going to show you what it is. But you've got to trust me. Sit down for what, Jesus? We're going to sit here and contemplate this a little longer? No. I'm getting ready to feed them. You're going to have to trust me with it. How many times in our lives does God bring something in our path where we just have to trust God? God wants us to lean on him and get in and say, Lord, I don't understand. I got 10,000. They got 100 to 200,000. I don't understand. They got camels. They got swords. They got all this stuff. We got, we got 10,000 untrained men, too many. Now we've got 300. And now God said, and by the way, Gideon, I want you to climb down into the camp of the Midianites. God, that can't be a good idea. The, the Bible says that he feared. How do we know he feared? Because he took a servant with him. And God said, if, if you fear, take your buddy with you. Yeah, like, come on, man, let's go die together. If you fear, when do you fear? When you don't trust. You always fear when you don't trust. And when he went down, he didn't trust. But after, after the dream was had, and the interpretation was given, something happened. And I believe Gideon probably could have said to God, God, I still don't fully understand, but I trust you. I trust you. I have to believe that was Abraham's spirit when God said, oh, by the way, Abraham, that son you've been waiting for for a long time that's now 30 years old, I want you to take him and kill him. I'm sure Abraham had to say, at least in his heart, God, I do not understand. But he obeyed. I believe he trusted. At some point in Moses' life, Moses, we read it all throughout Hebrews. There was faith, by faith, Abel, by faith, Enoch, by faith, Abraham, by faith, Moses. At some point, Moses had to trust God at some point. And I'm sure there were so many things, Lord, I don't understand. And God said, you don't have to understand. You just need to trust. You may be going through something or you may... God may be dealing with you personally about something. Uh, one of the things I think applies to all of these is, is giving. You know, sometimes when God tells you to give and he urges on your heart to give, then he tells you in your word a certain amount you're supposed to give or a certain percentage. And we're like, Lord, I don't understand how we can do that. And, he, and God's like, you don't have to understand. It doesn't have to make sense on your budget. It doesn't have to make sense in your bank account. You just need to obey and you need to trust. The same thing was true with Gideon. What do we do when God does something we don't understand? Number one, you obey. Number two, you trust. And then the last thing is this. The third thing is you always give God glory. You always give God glory. Which really in this story is what it was all about anyway. He said early in the chapter, he said, the reason I have to minimize your army is because if I don't, you're going to say that you won. But if I bring you guys down to 300 and I take away your swords and you fight with a, a you, you fight with a lighter and a tea pitcher and a little bugle, what are you going to tell people? Yeah, you should have seen them. I whipped them in the head with a bugle. All 100,000 of them. No, you're going to say, we didn't do a thing. God turned them against themselves. He said, the reason that I have to do this is so that when we win, God said, it's already done. I've already given into your hands. But when we do, at least now you know who did it. Sometimes God does things in our life that we don't understand. Here it is, number three, so that he can gain glory. Lord, we fished all night. We've caught nothing. Fish again. Nevertheless, in thy word, they drop their nets. They bring in so many, they've got to call their buddies. How do you explain that, God? 
Have the men sit down. What do you mean? We've got a bag lunch. We got five silver dollar pancakes. We got two sardines. It doesn't matter. I'm God. If I can speak light into existence, I can spread this out over thousands. And he did. And then afterwards, just to show off, after everybody was full, he said, gather the fragments. <laughs> the fragments, 12 baskets filled. Why did God wait till then? Why did God do things over and over and over in the scriptures that people didn't understand so that he could get glory out of it? Why does God sometimes put you in a situation that, that you can't even imagine God doing that? You, say, you, you would say, God, I thought you loved me. That's what the, the guy said today. He's 31 years old. He said, sometimes I wonder if God even loves me because he puts me in these situations. And of course, I, I get real huffy when you talk about God. I said, number one, God didn't put you in that situation, buddy. I don't know you from Adam, but your dumb choices put you in that situation. I said, truth is, the only thing God did was allow you to make a mess of things so that you'll turn to him. Then I didn't want to punch him in the face since so I'm looking for an exit door. The truth is, we had a good talk. Truth is, it's not God's fault. And, and I don't, truth is, I'm not God. I don't understand. Here, here, here's a verse we all know. Isaiah 55, 6. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their way, the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Here's the verses. Isaiah 55, verse 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are my ways your ways, saith the Lord. For as high as are the heavens are above the earth, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. God said, you can't even compare my thinking and my understanding and my plan to yours. And there are times in your life, even for this gentleman that we prayed with today, there, there's times in our life we don't understand, but you hear me, God does. And when I'm in that moment, these are the only three things God wants me to do. Number one, obey. Number two, trust him. And number three, always be looking and always be ready and always be willing to find a way to give God glory. I simply wonder how Gideon's night went after that. Sometimes I have, I, I can remember services we've had or visits we've made and people we've seen come to Christ or just something great, some, some big event or just Sometimes God's man's one of those. We're just after God's man on Friday night. You get this place filled, and then everybody's kind of, they, they've left, and people are just stirring around a little bit. And you're just, I just stand there, and I'm like, wow, wow. There's times we've been around the altar. I can think of a few times when we've just kind of corporately gathered around the altar, and we've seen God do some, just some amazing things. And I just have to sit back, and I'm like, Lord, wow. I, I wonder if, if that night, Brother David, I, I wonder if, if Gideon, once the dust settled and their torches were about burnt out and they were in the clear, I wonder if Gideon just didn't look at everything and just say, God, you did this. And at the end, when they experienced victory, I wonder if Gideon didn't say, and now I understand. See, sometimes God even has to take us to the battlefield for us to understand some things. I, I don't know what you're going through tonight. I know this. This is a universal issue. There are things that happen to, to pastors. I sat with the pastor last night visiting in his home, he and his wife, and um, they, they've been visiting our church. And I, uh, He was telling me just stories and pastors can relate to pastor stories. I was talking to a pastor today. He was just venting his frustration about some things going on in his church. And I'm just sitting there listening and trying to give a good ear. 
And truth is, I look at their situations, and honestly, I, I, I step back and say, I really don't understand why people do that. I don't understand how things like that can happen. I mean, there are just some, some sad stories, not just in the past, but just all over the place. But it doesn't change the fact that, number one, God is God. He's always God. It doesn't change the fact, number two, He's always good. All the time. And all the time, God is good. Amen? But it also doesn't change these principles that even in the midst of an I don't understand time, you still obey God. You still trust God find a way to give God glory. You've been listening to the Free Will Baptist Hour, today featuring a message from Pastor Scott Coghill at Pleasant Acres Free Will Baptist Church, located at 2911 Old Cherry Point Road in New Bern. You're invited to join us for worship on Sunday mornings at 11. Sunday school begins at 10, and our Sunday evening worship is at 6.30. We're also the home of New Bern Christian Academy, educating the mind and instructing the heart. To learn more about our ministry, give us a call at 252-637-2704. That's area code 252-637-2704. Or check us out online at pleasantacreschurch.org. That's pleasantacreschurch.org. Well, thank you for joining us today, and we hope you'll be with us again next week at the same time for another edition of the Free Will Baptist Hour.